Oh, access to food is a basic human right, but that food also has to be both nutritious and most importantly safe. Sadly, it's not true for an awful number of people around the world. The World Health Organization saying it does affect uh, about one in every 10 people. Well, microbiology expert, it's Dr. or rather Professor uh, Lucia Anelic joining us uh, this morning to talk about this. Hello to you, Prof. Appreciate the time. And when we talk about uh, people falling sick as a result of bad food, hygiene and food safety let's just start here what do we mean by that is this on the cooking phase are we talking salmonella are we talking in someone's household where are we talking about good morning good morning to everyone yes it's probably all of the above um, at home it's important to practice good hygiene practices in terms of washing hands before preparing food using potable water to wash fresh fruit and vegetables, especially if one is making a raw salad. Um, things like, you know, there are certain bacteria that are associated naturally with certain um, foods, especially raw foods like chicken. So it's important that one does actually not wash a raw chicken in one's sink. Um, and, you know, this is something that the Food Standards Agency of the UK and also in the United States, the FDA, are punting that extremely hard to the consumers. So, yes, it, it can happen at every stage in the food chain. Uh, now, the problem with the food chain as well is an expert such as yourself, Prof, you'll know this. I would imagine, I certainly hope that most restaurants would know this, but I don't think the average person cooking food at home uh, for their family just before they're going to bed is going to understand that you can't necessarily use the same utensils that you cooked a uh, raw chicken with to then go and cook a raw steak or throw it into a pot of potatoes. There is that cross contamination. I mean, how, uh, what are the odds of, of getting cross-contamination in your own home? Actually, quite common, if that is not practiced correctly, as you say. The cross-contamination comes from using surfaces like a plastic board or a glass board on which you are cutting uh, pieces of chicken or preparing chicken, raw meat, etc., uh, and then cooking that and then bringing that cooked product back onto those surfaces using the same utensils that you did not wash after preparing the raw product. So that's really, really important because there might be some juices uh, left behind on those surfaces uh, from the raw meat and then you're putting the cooked meat, which is now probably safe because you've killed any potential bacteria that might have been there, back onto the raw juices so that recontaminates the cooked food which you are now going to eat. And I mean, beyond the food safety of something like salmonella, which is obviously very, very dangerous and can happen very quickly, uh, even just slightly underdone, undercooked chicken, you can still f get sick from that. So that doesn't kill all the bacteria. Restaurants have to also be very careful. Even cooking at home, you have to be careful because we bring in the issue of food allergies as well. Someone might have yes. a nut allergy. Now, a nut allergy is no laughing matter, is it? You can kill someone. Absolutely. There are certain allergens in food that really do hurt people very badly and actually can kill, as you say. So an allergen is also a category of food safety hazard, as we call it, that is important to take note of. And the cross-contamination issue that I've just explained from a microorganism perspective is exactly the same for allergens. One must be very careful in preparing food for a person who's allergic to a particular constituent in that food and not cross-contaminate in the kitchen. I wanted to take a look, uh, Prof, if you don't mind, at the World Health Organization as well, and I'm sure you'll be aware of much of what I'm going to name now. But help me understand the differences, if it's okay with you, maybe just uh, to entertain me for a second, the differences between food, uh, when we talk about bacteria, we talk about viruses, and we talk about parasites. I would have kind of grouped them all in, in one, but that's why I'm only a journalist. I'm not a professor on food safety. What would the differences there be? Well, bacteria in food can grow in the food. So they use the uh, nutritional content of food to actually multiply to large numbers. And this is what can cause foodborne illness or food poisoning. Those bacteria, some of them, not all of them, can also produce toxins while they are growing in the food. And so that is the important part of the bacterial aspect. Also, certain bacteria form spores in food, which are more heat resistant. 
So when it comes to cooking, it can actually survive certain cooking processes. So these are all aspects that we have to take into account. Viruses, on the other hand, do not grow in food. They cannot grow outside their host, whatever the host may be, whether it's an animal or a human being or even a plant virus. But what they do do is that they are conveyed via food into the human body. And then they can start actually infecting the body, growing in the body and causing foodborne disease. A mm. typical example is hepatitis A. Hepatitis A can do this actually very well. And then, of course, protozoa or pr parasites, they also produce all sorts of structures that can help them to survive uh, various heating processes or colds or things like that. And then they can actually grow and multiply and cause foodborne disease as well. Uh, well, now, I hope we haven't uh, created any sort of mild public panic, uh, Professor. I'm sure we haven't. It's about just ensuring that people understand what they're getting themselves into, what they have to look out for. But from the food safety perspective, uh, obviously, uh, Analytch Consulting, you work, I'm sure, within the industry, within the hospitality industry, within the food industry, down that value chain. Where and how and should, maybe, is the first part of my question. How do we make it better for the public, make it a public health priority right now you're getting warnings on cigarettes you're getting warning on alcohol uh, the dangers of that where does the health and the education for the public need to be improved if at all i'm not saying it has to be you tell me does it need to be improved i think it does i think we are um r relatively unaware of the type of foodborne disease uh, situations that can occur. And there should be more consumer awareness put out there related to everything we've discussed this morning, how to handle food in the kitchen, buying uh, food that is perishable from the, from the supermarkets, bringing it home and not riding around for two hours in your car where the raw chicken, raw meat, raw fish, etc., even milk for that matter, if you have pasteurized milk in your grocery bag and it's in your boot and our hot summers you driving around for two to three hours before you get home you've broken the cold chain already as a consumer so there are so many things we can do as consumers that are relatively simple but uh, need to be made aware of and we do need our authorities as well to embark on these kind of campaigns as do the food standards agencies in other countries uh, and Professor, I'm going to ask this as a last question. You just made me think of it when you mentioned cold chain storage, uh, cold chain transport. Blackouts can't be helping right now yeah. as well. That's a reality for all of us every day. The fridges are going off. They're coming on. They're going off. Some of the fruit is partly defrosting. Some of it is completely defrosting. Maybe there's a PSA, a public service announcement. What does somebody do at home if they had a packet of chicken uh, overnight and the power's gone out? It's now warm, but it's not hot but we haven't cooked it it's still in the fridge okay it's me it's me help me out here what, what do you do in a case like this what do we do Absolutely. Yeah. So luckily, if you keep your fridge closed for uh, uh, at least four hours, your refrigerator should maintain most of its temperature, provided it was already running at four degrees Celsius when it started, when the load shedding started. So at least that helps. Uh, one could also add uh, cold packs that you have put in the freezer and if you have access to dry ice that helps tremendously to keep the temperature of the fridge at what it should be. But coming to your point, if you've had the kind of load shedding where your chicken has actually gotten warm, then definitely it should not be cooked and should not be consumed because the number of bacteria in there have already multiplied uh, because of the warm temperature to very high numbers. And that can certainly affect people and injure and maybe even kill people. Yeah, that's exactly why I wanted to ask the question. As I say goodbye to you, Prof, thank you very much indeed. Yeah, the blackout's making it very difficult uh, trying to keep food from spoiling, uh, but also even just keeping your food safe as well. So as you heard from the Prof, especially when it comes to chicken and salmonella, it's so important as well. It's got to be a case of if there is uh, low chilling and the chicken has gone warm, uh, do not cook it. Do not eat it, I'm afraid. Rather, throw it away. My thanks to Professor Lucia Analich, Director of Analich Consulting Food Safety Solutions.